It's a great honor for me to be here in Maribor. It's the first time I've been in this city, the first time I've been, of course, to this university. And I'm very pleased to have been invited, particularly to talk about this topic on which I've been engaged now, more or less for since the mid-1980s in various ways. And in the last few years since I retired from my full professorship, even more so traveling around the world talking about the abolition of capital punishment, uh, especially in the Caribbean area, in the United States, and in China, Japan, Taiwan, and in Africa. What I want to do in this lecture is to try to provide you with an up-to-date survey and analysis of the extent to which, and the reasons why, more and more countries have in recent years embraced the goal of universal abolition of capital punishment. This was first laid down by resolution of the UN General Assembly 40 years ago in 1971. And this resolution stated, in order to fully guarantee the right to life provided for in Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the main objective to be pursued is that of progressively restricting the number of offences for which capital punishment might be imposed with a view to the desirability of abolishing this punishment in all countries. In other words, this was a global perspective in relation to capital punishment. The survey will reveal that over the last 20 years or so, a new dynamic has been at work, one which has sought to move the debate about capital punishment beyond the view, one might say the parochial view, that each nation has the sovereign right to retain the death penalty as a repressive tool of its criminal justice system on the grounds of its purported utility in deterring murder or other crimes for which capital punishment is uh, found in law or the cultural expectations of its citizens and instead to ban it on the grounds that the punishment of death inevitably, and however it's administered, violates universally accepted human rights, namely the right to life, and secondly, and just as important in my view, the right not to be subjected to a cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. There remain challenges ahead to get this view accepted by all countries, as we recently witnessed I'm sure you read about it in the execution of Troy Davis in Georgia, USA, a young man who was convicted of shooting an off-duty policeman, but who pleaded to the very end when he was being sedated to be killed by lethal injection that he was innocent. And a young man for whom six of the seven witnesses who had originally claimed that they saw him do the shooting recanted their, uh, their, their evidence. And furthermore, it was virtually 20 years that he'd been in prison when he was taken out and executed. I believe, however, that the movement to abolish the death penalty worldwide now looks irresistible. And I shall conclude with the optimistic assessment that those states that still retain it in law and use it in practice will become more and more isolated. They will come under increasing pressure to protect the human rights of all their citizens, even the worst behaved among them, and to accept an international human rights norm that rejects completely an outmoded, cruel, and dehumanizing punishment. Let me go back a bit. One needs some background to these changes. If one takes the beginning of the movement to abolish the death penalty to be the publication in 1764, of Cesare Beccaria's famous book on crimes and punishments. One can certainly say that over the next 200 years, progress towards that objective was gradual, indeed slow, and often uncertain. By the time that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was promulgated in 1948, just after the Second World War, there were still only seven independent states in the world that had abolished the death penalty for all crimes in all circumstances. That means in civil law, in military law, 
uh, in time of war and time of peace. Complete abolition of any death penalty. And the majority of those that are in South America and the only one in continental Europe uh, was the tiny city-state of San Marino. Seven other European countries had abolished it for murder and other crimes, but retained it for treason and certain crimes committed in time of war. Three of these, Denmark, the Netherlands and Norway, executed collaborators and others guilty of war crimes after the Second World War. That's only 14 countries, and that hardly constituted a pressure group. So no wonder that there was no mention at that time of the death penalty in relation to Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was that every human being has an inherent right to life. The Universal Declaration was silent on the death penalty. But it was not silent as regards the European Convention of Human Rights, which was established in 1950, when it was explicitly made an exception to the right to life. By the year 1966, the year that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which of course was a covenant which tried to put some, some treaty out of the Universal Declaration, there were still only 26 abolitionist countries, several of them very small states, and only 12 countries had still abolished it for all crimes in peacetime and wartime in civil and military law. West Germany being the only large European country among them. Again, especially when it's noted that the text of Article 6 of the ICCPR, which guarantees an inherent right to life, had been drafted in 1957 and not altered, it's not surprising that that did not ban the death penalty. All that could be achieved by abolitionists was Article 6.2, which was an attempt to restrict the scope of the death penalty in countries that retained it to, I quote, the most serious crimes. Countries that retained it had to use it only for the most serious crimes. But that's obviously an exceptionally vague and potentially elastic concept. What are the most serious crimes? Nevertheless, and this is important to remember as this lecture goes on, the direction the policy ought to take was indicated in Article 6, 6 of the ICCPR, which stated, nothing in this article should be invoked to delay or to prevent the abolition of capital punishment by any state party to the covenant. A clear indication of what the goal should be, and I have already mentioned that the UN resolution of 1971 backed that up emphatically. However, there was not much optimism around about whether and when total abolition could be achieved. Firstly, the renowned French jurist, Professor Marc Ancel, who was a leading figure in the Society for Social Defense, had spelled out in 1962 in a report on the death penalty in European countries for the Council of Europe what he saw as a typical sequence of events leading to abolition. He said, it's usually taken a long time and followed a distinctive pattern. First, the reduction of the number of crimes legally punishable by death until only murder and sometimes treason are left, then systematic use of commutation, leading to de facto abolition. In other words, death sentences passed, but nobody executed, and eventual abolition de jure. But secondly, he added this point. This sequence, he thought, did not necessarily envisage the complete and final abolition of capital punishment whatever the circumstances might be in the future. He put it like this. Even the most convinced abolitionists realize that there may be special circumstances or particularly troubles, troublous times which justify the introduction of the death penalty for a limited period. 
In other words, once abolished, it did not necessarily have to stay abolished. So while countries might abolish it for ordinary crimes including murder, they typically wanted to hang on to it for possible use for crimes that threatened the state and in circumstances of war, especially offences against military discipline. Pessimism was evident as recently as 1986, just 25 years ago, when the distinguished German criminologist, Professor Gunther Kaiser, the director of the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg, writing for the United Nations at a time when 130 countries still retained the death penalty in law, concluded, and I quote him, Today there appears to be little hope that international bodies, whether private or official, will be able to achieve unanimity among the majority of countries concerning the restriction or abolition of capital punishment. Efforts aiming at worldwide abolition, therefore, have to be regarded as a means of keeping the international discussion going. And his pessimism was shared by the UN staff in their introduction, when they, which they concluded with the words, it would appear that the goal of the abolition of capital punishment throughout the world remains remote. I began with these remarks because they illustrate how very different the situation and the prognosis were with regard to abolition of the death penalty less than a quarter of a century ago than they are today. Just 22 years ago, at the end of 1988, there were 52 countries of the 180 member states of the UN, which is 29%, that had abolished the death penalty for murder and other common crimes. But only 35 countries, less than a fifth of all nations, had eliminated capital punishment altogether from their penal and military codes. What's happened since then? Well, in the last 20 years, the number of abolitionist nations has doubled to 104 of the 196 now UN member states. And the vast majority of them, 96 of this 104, have abolished it for all crimes in all circumstances. Thus, the majority of countries since the end of the 1980s have moved swiftly from executions to complete abolition. Not at all like the prognosis and the pattern that Marc Ancel had found in the early 1960s. The pattern of long drawn out phase of being abolitionist de facto was not observed in well over half of those countries which have embraced abolition in the last 20 years. For example, Turkmenistan abolished capital punishment in 1999, just two years after the last execution. South Africa in 1995, just four years after its last execution. And furthermore, the majority, over eight out of 10, of those who abolished the death penalty for the first time since 1989, did so completely in one go, so to speak. Unlike earlier abolitionist countries, such as the Netherlands, Italy and the UK, the first abolished it for ordinary crimes before extending it to crimes against the state and military offences often much later. The Netherlands is an extreme example. There was a 112 year gap between abolition of the death penalty for murder in the Netherlands in 1870 and for all crimes in 1982. In Italy, there was a 47 year gap between the abolition of capital punishment for murder in 1947 and abolishing it altogether. It's notable also that it's been rare, very rare, for countries that abolish the death penalty to, re to, uh, <coughs> to reintroduce it. Since 1961, there have only been five nations that have done that, but only one of them, the Philippines, it resumed executions. Seven people were executed in 1999 and 2000, 
But by 2006, the, the Philippines had abolished the death penalty completely by overwhelming majorities of both its Senate and Congress. As the distinguished human rights lawyer William Shabas has pointed out, we're moving towards a point where, as he put it, the death penalty, once abolished, is abolished forever. In the USA, which of course is a focal point for abolitionists, and about which I'll have more to say later, New Jersey, New York, New Mexico and Illinois have all recently abolished capital punishment, bringing the number of abolitionist states to 16, plus the District of Columbia. And although there are still 92 countries that retain the death penalty in law, only 43 of them, less than half, have executed anyone within the past 10 years and not yet announced a moratorium on executions less than a quarter of all nations. And Amnesty International regards 34 of the remaining 49 as truly abolitionist in practice. Thus 70% of states, 138 out of 196, no longer inflict or apparently intend to inflict the ultimate penalty. At the UN General Assembly in December of last year, only 41 of the 185 countries that voted on a resolution, that's 22%, voted against a resolution calling for a worldwide moratorium on death sentences and executions. Now, in addition, many of the countries that have retained the death penalty have moved towards restricting the types of crimes for which it may be imposed. And the UN Human Rights Committee and Commission now the Human Rights Council, has been active in defining what crimes do not qualify as most serious crimes, including economic offences, religious offences, drugs offences, and several other crimes not of the most serious kind and life-threatening kind. And although the death penalty is still retained for drugs offences in 32 countries, only six of them have regularly carried out executions in the past few years on any substantial scale. It appears that the number of states that regularly carry out executions for crimes other than murder is now quite small. small. Notably China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam and North Korea. Furthermore, great strides have been made in banning the imposition of the death penalty as a mandatory punishment for drugs offences, robbery and for murder. This has recently been done in East Africa, in Uganda, in Kenya and in Malawi and I've just heard today in Barbados in the West Indies. It appears that the majority of retentionist countries are coming to accept that capital punishment prior to complete abolition can only be justified on a discretionary basis for the worst of the worst cases of murder. Thus the number of countries actually carrying out judicial executions each year has shrunk drastically. Although 67 countries, according to Amnesty International, imposed at least one death sentence in 2010, only 23 countries carried out an execution last year. That's compared with 40 in 1997. With a few exceptions, I'm sorry to say, such as Iran, the number of executions annually recorded appears to be falling almost everywhere. Let me give you an example. Singapore, which in the mid-1990s had the world's highest execution rate per head of population, appears to have executed only one person in 2009, and I've yet to hear of anyone executed last year. Pakistan, which had executed 34 people in 2008, has, as far as we know, not executed any person since. Executions on a substantial scale, by which I mean, say, more than 10 persons a year, are only carried out regularly in about eight countries of the world. You may also be aware 
then at the international level, it's highly significant that the death penalty was excluded as a punishment by the UN Security Council when it established the International Criminal Tribunals to deal with the atrocities in the former Yugoslavia in 1993 and the, the terrible genocide in Rwanda in 1994 and later the terrible killings in Sierra Leone and in the Lebanon. Nor is it available as a sanction for genocide, other grave crimes against humanity and war crimes in the statute of the International Criminal Court established in 1998. Now this has provided a powerful argument. If it's not available for these, the most atrocious of crimes, why should it be the punishment for lesser crimes? Well, I mentioned a new dynamic. There's certainly been a new dynamic, something that has created this surge of abolition around the world. Since 1989, the year that Slovenia abolished capital punishment for all crimes and in all circumstances. And there can be no doubt that the latest wave of abolition has been influenced greatly by the process of democratization in Europe, including the former Soviet empire, and freedom from colonial and post-colonial repression in Africa and several other parts of the world, including Cambodia in Asia. And foremost amongst these influences has been the insertion into instruments of international human rights covenants and treaties, distinct protocols aiming at worldwide abolition of the death penalty, under which countries commit not to use the death penalty, nor to reintroduce it. The most notable amongst these in the international sphere is protocol number two to the ICCPR of 1989, again a very notable date, and the regional protocols to the European Convention on Human Rights and the protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights. Also, in over half the countries that have joined the abolitionist camp since the end of 1988, the death penalty is specifically banned in their democratically inspired constitutions, such as in Article 17 of your constitution of 1991, or their constitutional courts, as in South Africa, Hungary, and Namibia, for instance, have banned it under the right to life provisions of their constitutions, which allows no exception to this right. Altogether so far, 82 countries have ratified or signed one or other of the international treaties or conventions which bars the imposition and reintroduction of capital punishment. But what has been this dynamic, this human rights approach? What does it stand for? The human rights approach to abolition rejects certainly the most persistent of justifications for capital punishment. Retribution and the need to denounce, expiate and eliminate through execution those whose crimes shock society by their brutality or other forms of seriousness. It holds that all human beings have a right to be able to redeem themselves and that a state has no right to take the life of one of its citizens. It also rejects the utilitarian justification, the deterrent justification, that nothing less severe can act as a sufficient deterrent to those who contemplate committing capital crimes. This is not only because the social science evidence does not support the claim that capital punishment is necessary to deter murder and that it is more marginally effective than life in long-term imprisonment, but because even if it could have a marginally greater deterrent effect, that could only be achieved by high rates of execution, mandatorily and speedily enforced. That is, the certainty of execution, not just the vague possibility of it. And this abolitionists assert would increase the probability of innocent or wrongfully convicted persons being executed, 
and also lead to the execution of people who, because of the mitigating circumstances in which their crimes were committed, do not deserve to die. How has this been brought forward? Well, it's really quite a simple story. It's needed political leadership, particularly from the Council of Europe and the European Union and individual European nations, and from constitutional courts, backed up by NGOs, especially but not only Amnesty International, bodies that have come into being like the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, to bring about abolition. Political will has been the key. It's been political leadership which has brought about abolition. Now, of course, an objection to that might be that public opinion demands the death penalty. But abolitionists believe that although public opinion cannot obviously be ignored in democratic structures, a country concerned for human rights, that is, to protect citizens from abuse by state authorities, should not merely accept it as a reason for retaining the death penalty, especially when public opinion may be based on misconceptions about the assumed deterrent effect of capital punishment. The fairness of his application, is it evenly applied? Or is it applied in a arbitrary or discriminatory way? Can it be applied with utter absence of error and other human rights considerations? When you come to public opinion surveys, you will find in many uh, that there's an enormous amount of ignorance about the death penalty and the way it's enforced. And it needs also to be remembered that no countries have abolished the death penalty because of popular demand, as reflected in opinion polls. And a government committed to human rights should instead regard its task as informing and leading the general public to appreciate and then accept the human rights case for abolition, which is put succinctly by the EU as it contributes to the enhancement of human dignity and the progressive development of human rights. All our experience tends to show that people who grow up with the expectation that death will be the punishment for murder are relatively slow to abandon this idea. But we know that after abolition, the next generation, growing to maturity with no such experience and no such expectation that people will be put to death, is far more likely to regard capital punishment as a barbaric relic of the past, abandoned as civilization has progressed. It was of great significance that in post-apartheid South Africa, a country racked by turmoil and a very high murder rate, one of the highest in, in the world, the newly created Constitutional Court abolished the death penalty in 1995 in favor of public opinion clearly in its favor. The court declared that the death penalty was incompatible with the prohibition against cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment, and with a human rights culture, which would, and this is a very important quotation, protect the rights of minorities and others who cannot protect their rights adequately through the democratic process. In other words, the court sought to protect people who were in a weak position as regards state power. The influence exerted by weights of the weight of numbers as more and more countries have embraced the human rights case for abolition is illustrated very well by the change in the decisions reached regarding extradition of prisoners from Canada to the USA to states where they might suffer sentences to death and execution. In 1991, that's right at the beginning of the period we're talking about, in the case which was called Kindler versus Canada, both the Canadian Supreme Court and the UN Human Rights Committee held that there was no bar uh, of, to extradition of Mr. Kindler 
to the state of Pennsylvania, which has the death penalty. Because it held, there was no international consensus on the issue of capital punishment. Yet only 10 years later, in a case called Burns versus the USA in 2001, and another case before the Human Rights Committee of the same kind, both bodies held that it would be a violation of the defendant's right to life to extradite to the USA, in the case of Burns, to the state of Washington on a capital charge without assurances that Mr. Burns would not be executed. They did so because, as the Canadian Supreme Court put it, of the significant movement towards acceptance internationally of a principle of fundamental justice, namely the abolition of capital punishment. One could not have heard that, as we know, 10 years earlier. But the weight of numbers, the growth of the movement, has made people see this as an inevitable movement of human rights across the globe. And in similar vein, in the well-known case of Ossolan versus Turkey, uh, a Kurdish rebel, in March of 2003, the European Court of Human Rights endorsed the view that capital punishment amounts to a form of inhuman, inhuman treatment, which, I quote, can no longer be seen as having any legitimate place in a democratic society. Here are two major courts of human rights which have decided in the same way. Let me say something about what has been achieved in different parts of the world and where there might well be still resistance to this movement. It's clear that the effect of this new human rights dynamic has been remarkable. Abolition has been embraced across the globe by many different political systems, peoples and cultures. In Europe, only Belarus retains and uses the death penalty, but there were only two executions last year compared with 47, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, in 1998. And the government of Belarus has informed the UN Human Rights Council that it will abolish capital punishment after it's molded public opinion to accept it. In South and Central America, there are only three small countries, Belize, Guyana, and Suriname, that hang on to it in their law, although none of them have carried out an execution for over 10 years. There have been no executions in Cuba since 2003. The Commonwealth Caribbean island states, the former British colonies, grimly maintain it in law, although the mother country, if it could use that term, the colonial power, gave it up 40 years ago, over 40 years ago. But they have not, on the whole, been able to execute anyone because of successful challenges by dedicated human rights lawyers. There's only been one execution in that region in the last 10 years. Africa has seen an extraordinary change. At the end of 1988, when I made my first report for the UN, in the African region, the UN African region, you might say it's not really Africa, only Seychelles and the island of Cape Verde had abolished capital punishment. Whereas 16 countries are now completely abolitionist, the most recent being Burundi, Togo and the Gabon, and another 21 have not carried out an execution for at least 10 years. Executions in Africa south of Sahara are now very rare. Only one in 2009 in Botswana, and last year in Botswana, Equatorial Guinea under a military code, Sudan and Somalia, which might not surprise you. Although all countries in the Middle East and North Africa, where Islam is the dominant religion, retain the death penalty, three of them, Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco, have not carried out any judicial executions for 18 years. And the new government of Tunisia has promised to ratify the protocol to the ICCPR abolishing the death penalty. Abolition has also been under consideration in Jordan, Morocco and Lebanon, and executions have sharply declined in Egypt, 
Many human rights activists in the area have hopes that the so-called Arab Spring will further boost the abolitionist movement. And in fact, several secular states with large Muslim majorities have already joined the abolitionist movement, such as Albania and Bosnia-Herzegovina in this region, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, Turkmenistan, and Senegal. And they may soon be joined by the island states of the Maldives. Execution rates have been maintained at a low level in Muslim Asia. And in fact, only four, um, <coughs> four retentionist Muslim countries now make regular and large-scale use of capital punishment as a crime control measure. You won't be surprised, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq under its very difficult conditions, and the Yemen. And according to Arab human rights scholars, whether and what speed retentionist Islamic states will move towards abolition will depend on whether their legal systems remain dominated by fundamentalist interpretations of Islam, or whether these states move towards secular democratic government which will allow for what they call a more modern, scientific, less authoritarian, and more merciful interpretation of the Sharia. Overall, the prospects for a steady movement towards abolition in the Muslim world are not nearly as bleak as some may imagine. What about Asia? Only four Asian states, Nepal, Bhutan, Cambodia, and the Philippines, have so far completely abolished the death penalty. But six others are now abolitionist de facto, meaning that they haven't executed for anybody for over 10 years, the most recent being South Korea. And in January of last year, the president of Mongolia called on the Mongolian parliament to follow the path of the majority of the world's countries and abolish the death penalty, declaring the road a democratic Mongolia has to take ought to be clean and bloodless. In India, with the second largest population in the world, the death penalty is in principle, as laid down by the Indian Supreme Court, to be imposed in only the rarest of rare cases. The last execution took place in 2004, and that was the first since 1997. Vast country, two executions within the period since 1997. There is now a very heated controversy on one the slayers of Ravish, Ravish, uh, Rajiv Gandhi should finally put to death now their appeals have run out. Now I want to say a few words about China. Three years ago, the representative of the People's Republic of China, the country with the greatest population, the largest number of crimes subject to the death penalty, and by far the greatest number of executions, told the UN Human Rights Council, and I quote, the death penalty scope of application was to be reviewed shortly with the final aim of abolishment. That process has tentatively begun with the recent abolition of the death penalty for 13 non-violent economic offenses, thus reducing the number of capital crimes from a very high total of 68 to 55. But it is a movement in the right direction. Also, China has returned the review of all death penalty verdicts from the provincial high courts to the Supreme People's Court at the beginning of 2007. And according to the Chief Justice at that time, the aim was to abolish the death penalty, impose the death penalty, I'm sorry, strictly, cautiously and fairly on a tiny number of serious criminal offenders. This is seen as part of the project of President Hu Jintao for constructing a socialist harmonious society, the criminal policy of which is now to combine punishment with leniency. It's regrettable that we'll not be able to gauge how much this will reduce the number of executions because China still refuses to publish any statistics on the number of its citizens who are executed annually. And my own guess is the number will have to come down very considerably before China comes clean on its execution record. Nevertheless, there is in China a vigorous debate on the reform of the scope of the death penalty. I've been going to China since 2000, virtually every year, 
And when I first went to China, uh, sent with a small delegation by the British Home Se Foreign Secretary, we came up against a blank wall. You Westerners do not understand China. You don't understand why China needs capital punishment. And they set out to try to convince us uh, that China had a good case for the use of the death penalty. But just a year and a half ago, I think it must be now, at a meeting I was, I was in in China, a very senior scholar, a distinguished professor, well connected with the party, put it like this at an international meeting. The fast headway of abolition in the globe is amazing and exciting. These latest changes present a clear signal to us. Abolition is an inevitable international tide and trend, as well as a signal showing the broad-mindedness of civilized countries. Abolition is now an international obligation. I could not have imagined that anyone would have said this in public a decade ago when I first went to China. Furthermore, a recent major public opinion survey of over 4,000 citizens in three provinces carried out by the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg and by Peking University, has shown that the support of capital punishment, certainly on the present scale, is not nearly as strong as the authorities have claimed in China. For example, when asked whether China should speed up the process to ab abolish the death penalty, only just over half, 53%, were opposed to doing so, and a further 33% said they were unsure. This can hardly be said to indicate a fervent desire for capital punishment of a kind that would make abolition politically impossible to achieve. Let me now say a few words about the USA before concluding. The position taken by the United States, in my opinion, is crucial to achieving the goal of worldwide abolition. Because many retentionist states point to the USA in support of their position that the death penalty is not a human rights issue. How could it be, they say, if the great democratic champion of human rights still retains it? The United States has yet to embrace the aspiration embodied in Article 6 of the ICCPR and UN resolutions to abolish the death penalty in due course and indeed, its government has told UN in its surveys that they believe that in democratic societies, the criminal justice system, including the punishment prescribed for the most serious and aggravated crimes, should reflect the will of the people, freely expressed and appropriately implemented through their elected representatives. In other words, the, the push for abolition must come from the bottom, not the top. So what briefly are the prospects that the USA will abandon capital punishment? As in most of the rest of the world, the death penalty in the US is in decline. That might surprise you. Only 12 of the 51 US state jurisdictions actually executed anyone in 2010, and only seven of them, seven of them more than one person. At seven jurisdictions out of 51. Texas alone accounted for 17 of the 46 executions. Indeed, only 10 states have on average executed at least one person a year since executions were permitted to resume by the Supreme Court in 1976. And of these 10, eight of them are in the Old South, and plus Oklahoma and Ohio. The number of death sentences imposed in the USA has fallen from over 300 in the mid-1990s to only 114 in 2010. And two years ago, the influential American Law Institute, which had made, uh, proposed the model penal code on which the American capital punishment system is based, decided it would withdraw its support for the death penalty. I quote, in light of the current intractable institutional and structural obstacles to ensuring a minimally adequate system for administering capital punishment. Indeed, the growing disenchantment that the death penalty can be, can be administered fairly and without racial discrimination, combined with the very high cost of administering it, 
the evidence that even lethal injection cannot be guaranteed to result in a non-torturous death, and the incontrovertible evidence that innocent people have been sentenced to death may well persuade yet more states to follow the example of New Jersey, New York, New Mexico and Illinois to abolish the death penalty. The impression often given that in America there is enthusiasm everywhere for executions is now wide of the mark. And as you will know, in recent years, there's been some recognition by the US Supreme Court of norms that have been established elsewhere in the world. The decisions of the Supreme Court to ban the execution of the so-called mentally retarded in 2002 and of juveniles convicted of murders convicted before the age of 18 in 2005, both cited worldwide condemnation of these practices in support of the view that the trend towards abolition of capital punishment for these categories of persons in US states had revealed an emerging standard of decency in the USA. It's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? An emerging standard of decency. And we can hope that it will not be many years before the US Supreme Court will be able to find that the majority of states, in line with the majority of countries worldwide, do not support the death penalty for anyone and therefore rule that emerging standards of decency will no longer tolerate the use of capital punishment in any part of the USA. And when that happens, I think many other countries will follow suit. Let me just say in conclusion, there can be no doubt that the emphasis on universal human rights has added greatly to the moral force propelling the abolitionist movement. But there does remain a sizable, even if diminishing, number of countries that remain resistant to it. So what arguments can be employed to put further pressure on them to reconsider their stance? There's no doubt that some of the retentionist countries have regarded resolutions for a moratorium on all executions brought before the UN as, as they put it, divisive, and an attempt to impose the will of the majority on the minority. The pressure from the abolitionists has even been stigmatized as a form of cultural imperialism, cultural Western imperialism, and furthermore, an attack on the sovereignty of states. They claim that the death penalty is a criminal justice issue and not a human rights issue, as if it must be one or the other as if it is one, it cannot be the other. But clearly this is nonsense. In my opinion, this argument should be vigorously opposed on the grounds that it's a false antithesis. There are international treaties that li place limits on the powers of government in relation to how they treat their citizens. For example, it's now agreed by all countries that no country should enforce or permit slavery. Surely the same should be true as regards the weight and brutality of punishments inflicted on captive, convicted citizens. In other words, there should be limits to the power of the state that can be permitted to exercise over persons accused of and convicted of crimes, however serious. Limits defined by universal human rights principles which apply to all citizens of the world wherever they live. So although the choice of a system of punishments is a matter for national sovereignty and national governments, they should not include punishments such as the extinction of life that breach the human rights of the convicted. If I can now come back to what I mentioned at the beginning, the key to the argument of whether abolition of the death penalty should now be regarded as a goal that all countries committed to human rights should pursue lies in the interpretation of Article 6 and 7 to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which all but a few states, such as Saudi Arabia, have actually ratified or signed, as China has. As I mentioned at the beginning, the ICCPR is the child of a world in which the death penalty was commonplace in most countries. So no wonder that the ICCPR allowed an exception to the right to life for the most serious crimes. But it is absolutely clear, if you remember, that Article 6.6, which states 
that nothing in this article shall be invoked to delay or prevent the, uh, the abolishment of capital punishment by any state party to the covenant shows that the aspiration of the treaty was when taken in junction with Article 7 of the covenant, which banned any cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Now, those countries that still favor capital punishment in principle, so to speak, have been faced with convincing evidence of the abuses, discrimination, mistakes, and inhumanity which inevitably accompany it in practice, as has been revealed by death penalty scholars and human rights lawyers. In my view, it's incumbent on all states party to the ICCPR that still retain the death penalty to recognize they're morally bound by the universalistic goals of the International Covenant to do nothing to delay or prevent the final abolition of capital punishment. So, my friends, while the road is still rather rocky and the end's not yet in sight, retentionist countries are becoming more and more isolated, more and more under pressure to follow what seems to be now an irresistible global trend. The plain fact is that there are now very few nations that regularly execute their citizens. And where they do, in most of them, so few are executed that retention of capital punishment appears to have no more than a symbolic political purpose. Such countries are being forced to reconsider by the very weight of international opinion whether their system of criminal justice should allow the occasional and inevitably arbitrary elimination of convicted, captive citizens. Abolition of capital punishment and its replacement by a humane system of imprisonment is clearly becoming the litmus test for the respect of human rights. Thank you very much. Participants, uh, now it's time for questions, comments, discussion, ideas. Uh, you presented uh, a picture of uh, the worldwide trend that is uh, certainly welcoming from the point of view of uh, abolitionists, but uh, um, I'm not so sure that you actually presented a, a case for saying that the death penalty is in principle, uh, not just the, the way it has been administered uh, in, uh, in different countries such as China and Saudi Arabia and so on, <coughs> incompatible with human rights. I'm sure you know that uh, no serious moral philosopher, very few think that uh, the right to life is uh, absolute. Uh, most of them believe that you can forfeit your right to life. Uh, uh, and uh, so there's at least some logical space for, for uh, the claim that uh, people who have murdered someone have thereby forfeited their right to life. So uh, if the state uh, or whoever uh, is authorized to do so uh, uh, kills them, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that they have uh, violated their right to life. Uh, so I was won just wondering, I mean, it might be clear to you that uh, the right to life or acknowledging the right to life rules out death penalty in principle. It's not clear to me. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I think you make a very good point. Uh, of course, there is a discussion about whether the right to life encompasses a person who has 
denied another person the right to life. And uh, certainly uh, a number of philosophers, for example, the great British uh, uh, liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill, uh, in debating the death penalty in the English Parliament in the 1860s, came out very strongly in favour of the death penalty on the grounds that one of the grounds is that the person who had deprived a person of their life had lost their own right to life. Um, the interpretation of right to life in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, if one looks at it from the point of view of kind of international law, it's clear that Article 6.2, which provides an exception in countries which have retained the death penalty, use the death penalty for the most serious crimes, which personally I think ought to be only for murder, if it's going to be used at all, uh, because that right to life provision, in the way that you put it, really refers to, to murder, that is, not to say economic crimes or uh, to apostasy, uh, becoming a Christian when you are a Muslim, or anything of that kind. Uh, but it's quite clear from the covenant uh, that this exception was put in merely temporarily. It's quite clear that how this was interpreted in relation to Universal Declaration for Human Rights was to make the point the right to life was absolute. Now, I, I've thought about this quite a lot, and I personally would put my weight much more on Article 7 which is the right to be free of any punishment which is cruel, inhuman, and degrading. Because I think if you look at the way capital punishment is administered, it is inevitably, in the, virtually every case, impossible to do it without it being cruel, inhuman, and degrading in its administration. And it's impossible to do it without it being arbitrary, discriminatory, and with an absolute surety of lack of error. And so, if you were to push me into a corner, I would go and put my weight on Article 7 rather than Article 6. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so if we abolish this capital punishment, we take it out of the equation of, of uh, having it as a social punishment. So what, what happens then? What's the strategy that comes after the capital punishment? What are we going, what are we going to do with these people that we do not execute? Are we going to be them or are we going to uh, try to uh, turn them back into uh, normal human beings? I mean, how are we going to go on past this when this is done? Well, tell me what you've been doing in Slovenia. You haven't executed anybody since 1957. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, this is 50, 60 years it's virtually since anybody was executed uh, uh, in, this, in this, this country. And we found the, sa we found the same in Britain. That, uh, there is obviously then a question, which, which has to be asked, is what, 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 else, what should be done with persons who've committed very grave crimes, and particularly people who've committed murders. And there is a, a really very strong debate over this issue, which would take another lecture, really, to deal with. And it's, that is, should people lose their liberty forever? Should they be removed from society, not by death, but from what you might call a living kind of uh, social exclusion. Um, and in the United States, there has been a very strong move in many states to substitute the death penalty with life without parole. That is, without any hope of ever being released. And Sometimes this might be for those persons who might formally have been sentenced to death. You have to remember that in the United States, although executions are carried out, it, it, very few people amongst those who are convicted of murder are actually sentenced to death. Uh, 
and even fewer are eventually executed. Uh, the others, for example, those people who've committed murders in fits of jealous rage uh, within a family setting or when a fight in a bar has become over, over serious and somebody has stabbed somebody with a, a, a knife, those people on the whole are never sentenced to death. They're not convicted of capital murder. Capital murder is supposed to be kept for the very worst of the worst kinds of crimes. And what is happening in the United States, in a number of states, is that everybody who gets life imprisonment in, uh, I, I can't name the states just at the moment, but a number of them, gets life without parole. Now, I think that life without hope really has all the human rights uh, abuses connected with it, as death does almost all of them. Uh, and I'm, I'm really very much opposed to it. So I think to answer your question is that the punishment for murder ought to be a form of imprisonment which is discretionary for the court, that always takes into account factors of aggravation as well as mitigation. In other words, the punishment should be proportionate to the crime and to the motivation of the crime and the responsibility, culpability of the offender. And that it can range accordingly from a period of what we call a determinate period of imprisonment, um, say 15 years or 20 years or 30 years, depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, or it can be life imprisonment in cases in which the person is thought at the time to show very little prospect of, 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 of reformation or redemption, and that they might st remain a danger to society for the rest of their lives, but also always with the prospect that they will be given a form of imprisonment which will give them an opportunity to redeem themselves if they so wish, and that all should have the chance of release at some stage. Not that all will be released at some stage, but everybody should have the opportunity of release under very strict supervision and control and uh, with the possibility of return to prison if they prove dangerous to society. The fact of the matter is that most people commit murder will never commit another murder. Yeah, that was a long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> My question would be, uh, are there any systems which act or which are organized according to the way you have been just suggesting? What would you give as a model system in this area? Yes, there are, there are systems, I think, in a great deal in, in European countries, um, uh, in Scandinavian countries, are much the same. In Britain, we, we do have the possibility that was introduced recently that somebody could be sentenced to life imprisonment being for the rest of life under a set of guidelines laid down by Parliament for the very worst kind of multiple murders involving uh, sexual assault and um, rape and torture of children, for example. Um, if you kill a policeman in England, it's likely that you would have to serve a minimum of 30 years. Uh, if you kill in a domestic situation, you would serve a minimum usually of 15 years, although it could be less with strong mitigating circumstances. Uh, but prisoners in England go through a system which is basically called a progressive stage system, in which they move according to the assessment of how serious they are, how dangerous they are, and other things, gradually from cl very close confinement to less close confinement to a period in an open institution with trials in the community carefully assessed, etc., before they can be released, and that they must be released through a judicialized parole system headed by a judge in which the prisoner can make representations and the state can make representations about whether they're fit for release. Um, that's, you know, broadly speaking, uh, what is done. Yeah. 
US Supreme Court, uh, in a famous case called McCleskey, uh, which showed very clearly st very strong statistical evidence that there was both arbitrariness and discrimination uh, in the probability that a black uh, defendant who killed a white person, particularly a policeman, was much more likely to be sentenced to death than a black person who killed another black person or a white person who killed a black person. It didn't really challenge uh, that evidence uh, what they said, in effect, was, well, you better show not on statistical probability, but actually, in this particular case, there was discrimination. Uh, and the, the, one of the reasons they said that was that, look, there's bound to be discrimination and arbitrariness across all of criminal justice. Are you telling us we've got to scrap the whole criminal justice system? Which basically is your point, I think. No, I, I think one of the points about the death penalty is that it is conclusive. You know, if you kill somebody, they're dead. You can't come back and say, sorry, we made a mistake, or sorry, we've treated you unfairly, unequally, in relation to other people who we've dealt with. I mean, these notions of some equity in the administration of, of uh, criminal, criminal justice uh, are really very strongly held in nearly all democratic countries, that punishment should not be arbitrary, they should not be discriminatory, they should be based upon well, well enunciated principles and consideration of factors in the same way from one case to another. And no, I, I, I quite agree with you. It's, it's, uh, these things apply all over. Yeah. Uh, I understand that the basic argument against the death penalty is that it is uh, cruel, inhuman, and degrading punishment. But my question is, if we put someone in a small closed room for 30, 40, 50 years, is that any less degrading? No, no it isn't. I just said that I'm completely against that idea. I don't think we should have punishments which are life without hope or are degrading. I'm completely against an alternative which would do that. So what would be the next step? The next step? Is still degrading or not degrading? Oh, it depends on, how, on, on what kind of regime there is, whether it's degrading or not degrading. I don't believe in any prison system that prisoners should be degraded. Any prisoner should be degraded. According to your experiences, uh, which arguments from those who speak in favor of death penalty, do you find most difficult to oppose? And um, with which arguments you try to, to change their views? Not, not by reading them, let's say, human rights articles and laws, but... You know. Well, I suppose an argument which is based upon a, uh, upon a view that death is death for murder or you know, some other offences is required within the culture and within the religious precepts by which people live. Uh, I mean, that's a great difficulty with Islam, I think, particularly with, uh, with Islam as practiced you know, in those where there's Sharia law. I mean, you're up against somebody who just isn't interested in listening to your argument. <laughs> cases of genocides like uh, which are which was with Hitler or Mladic in Bosnia yeah. or Saddam Hussein uh, these persons were they didn't actually kill these hundreds thousands of people but they were guilty yeah. uh, for them what is your personal opinion how should they be punished because I don't think so they should just be put uh, isolated or something uh, they should be something punished uh, in another way. What's your opinion? Well, well, uh, I'd like to turn that back to you. What do you have in mind other than some form of captivity? 
if you're against the death penalty, what, what do you have in mind? That's, that's the problem. I, I don't know any other uh, punishment since no. captivity or death penalty. No, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think that these persons should be uh, somehow punished and I, because they are guilty for uh, killing of thousands of people. Yes. And well, I agree they should be punished and I would punish them by very, very long periods of, of confinement. Obviously, these people ought not to go scot-free because that sends a message to other people that nothing will happen to you if you do such terrible things. Um, so there has to be punishment, uh, and the punishment should be very severe in terms of deprivation of liberty and deprivation of their property uh, and deprivation of, of, of various aspects maybe of citizenship. I mean, there are various things that could be done without killing them. Okay. Any other questions? So let's have the last question. Yeah. The, the first shall be last, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was a bit disappointed by your, uh, your answer to the previous, uh, to the previous question. Uh, I would have thought, I mean, I, I don't find appeals to tradition, whether cultural or religious. No, I can't hear you very well. I'm so. saying, I don't find appeals to tradition, whether religious or, cu or cultural, uh, uh, appealing at all. And the question was, which, not which, are, which kind of people uh, is it most, is it uh, hardest to convince, but which are the best arguments in favor of? Uh, of, uh, oh no! I'm sorry. I, I misinterpreted that question. I did interpret it as which, are the, which, what is the, what's the, the major problem about convincing people? And I really, really thought the major problem of convincing people is, well, particular people, is what I said. Um, I mean, I think the main main argument which has got to be faced is the argument I tried to put at the end of the lecture. Is this just a criminal justice issue? Or is it a human rights issue? Or is it a criminal justice issue which has constraints put by human rights on it? I think those people, I mean like the government of Singapore constantly says, this is not a matter for the United Nations, it's nothing to do with human rights. Now those, are, those people have to be convinced that this is a very poor argument. Yeah, but still, I mean, there is a perfectly good moral argument in favor of death penalty, and it goes like this. The penalty should be, first of all, just. Yes. And uh, a just penalty is a proportionate one, proportionate, proportionate to the offense or the crime. Yes. And it, it has to be based on desert. Yes. And the one who kills or murders someone deserves to die. Uh, no, 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 hold on. No. no, let me just ask you. Do you mean that everybody who kills somebody deserves to die? Or do you mean that amongst those people who kill somebody, some deserve to die? Well, there are mitigating uh, circumstances, I agree. But ah, yes. well, intentional well, murder, planned murder, uh, 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 conducted in cold blood, uh, or for particularly tri trivial reason, such as uh, robbery or whatever, I think uh, this is, I think, what mostly, and what appeals to most people who are in favor of death penalty is that it's actually, that these people actually deserve to die in, in virtue of what they did to other people. Well, look, uh, we could get into a very long discussion about this, but, you know, you can move the argument from the one which is, you know, if you like, uh, as you put it, a kind of moral principle argument that somebody who kills somebody deserves to die. Uh, you then are faced with the thing as well, which amongst them and for what do they deserve to die? What is actually proportionate? And how do we in law try to set up a system where only those who deserve to die, die, and only those where everybody agrees that they deserve to die, die. Now, one of the things that influenced me when I was a young student was that 
In Britain, we had come to a point after the Second World War where there had been various attempts to abolish capital punishment. Capital punishment was really being used very rarely uh, and various people were found guilty and sentenced to death for murder. It was mandatory and there was a great deal of sympathy for people who had been found guilty of the crime or set out in criminal law of murder but which people thought they didn't deserve to die. There was only one way around that, which was the raw prerogative of mercy, which wasn't really through the Crown, but through a politician who was the Secretary of State for Home Affairs. So the issue then came down as, well, what criteria are being used in deciding whether people should die or not die? And to cut a long story short, the Royal Commission on Capital Punishment spent from 19... 49 to 1953, trying to decide whether it was possible to define murders which deserve death in a way that would clearly indicate that only those who deserve death would be sentenced to death and others not. And they came to the conclusion that it was actually impossible to actually set down in law a category of persons only category of persons, all of whom should be sentenced to death, or majority of them, and some who are not. And actually that has been really one of the practical problems with the death penalty, which is separated from this human rights issue, that, that an attempt to try to define in law categories which are the worst of the worst, or the rarest of the rare, nearly always come unstuck, because they don't First of all, they are too broad, and they include people who many people don't think deserve to die, and therefore it sets up, of course, a great deal of sympathy amongst the population in relation to the use of the death penalty, or it doesn't catch people who deserve to die. And we had, we had, we had an attempt to do this in Britain. In, after this Royal Commission, a Conservative government um, a passed what they called a Homicide Act. And this was an act which tried to define capital murder, that is, for which the death penalty would be the punishment. And uh, it came into force in, in um, 1957, and by 1965 it was abolished completely, because it led to enormous anomalies. And and, and really absurd conclusions. Um, I remember, I got interested in it actually. It's the first time I got interested in this subject was as an undergraduate student going to the House of Commons and then subsequently to other debates in the House of Lords about this new proposed legislation. And what got me interested in this subject 54 years ago, 55 years ago pretty much, uh, I think I was 20 then, and I, I came to the conclusion that it would only lead to anomalies. And when I was a graduate student, we had cases where, where you could be, a capital crime was murder involving robbery and theft. Um, and there was a case of an 18-year-old boy who was involved in uh, a mugging. And uh, he... Uh, the boy was knocked to the ground and this chap, as he was going, gave him a kick which actually got him behind the ear here and it killed him. And he bent down and picked up a sixpenny piece that had rolled from this boy's pocket and put it in his pocket. That was capital murder. If he'd stamped on this boy's head and reduced it to pulp, if he cut his head off, he could not have been convicted of a capital crime. And that wasn't the only one of a lot of anomalous situations, which really created a great deal of sympathy for this young man. And actually was one of the things that kind of led to the demise of capital punishment. And we had cases of wrongful conviction of innocent people being executed. Um, you've probably seen the film, Have You Ten Rillington Place? Have you ever seen it? This is the murder 
of by a young man called Christie, who was um, Evans. Sorry, his name was Evans, uh, who was convicted and hanged for the murder of his wife and baby. He was a, a, a man of very limited intellect, and uh, two or three years later, the person who was the, uh, the uh, living in the house uh, and living below, it was found that he killed, I forget how many women, but the whole garden had to be dug up to find the number of women that he'd murdered. And he had not, uh, Evans had not committed the murder. This other man had done so. It, I mean, this is a real problem with capital punishment. I might feel in my, uh, when I said, even those who think in principle it would be good to kill people, have to face the fact that you can't create a system which will do it that doesn't invade and go against many principles that we hold dear and we think of as human rights. But we could go on debating this forever, but it's... I hope I haven't disappointed you so much with that answer. <laughs> okay, Roger, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, follow up thing that the spider clicked the video uh, of the box. He called us, called the manager, the Jake is the zone and of the box in the video. Uh, and was a little bit more chasing by the of Zora. Man, seminar, uh, and the whole project, over the hour of the equal remediation. The damage in the wall, the same age, the same one, the gladly running, the same thing. Good luck.